Great, the names are starting to flow in. Welcome from all over the world. Great to see. Well, it's um, three minutes into the, the time for our um, precious hour together. And so um, let me kick us off. Um, as I said a bit earlier for those that um, joined after the introduction, my name is Colleen Magna. I'm the Managing Director for the Rio Southern African Office and I'll be your host for the call. Um, and um, before I introduce the panelists, I just want to remind you of um, a few protocol issues regarding this webinar. Um, so uh, the panelists will be able to speak and you will see them as they speak. And uh, the participants can participate via the chat box. And the chat box is where you can type up any questions um, and uh, any observations or questions or introduction to yourself. Um, and we will review those questions when we get into the um, more open conversation time. Um, this call will uh, consist of two parts. The first part is a bit of introduction uh, to each of the projects and context. And then the second part is opening up to questions and learning. So the purpose of this call is really to think out loud together, to learn together. Um, as RIOS, um, we are building up uh, a bit of um, experience and stories of working specifically with um, violence against women all over the world. And for this call, we are joined by three RIOS colleagues who are deeply involved in projects in their own local context. So I'd like to welcome as panelists, um, Mariana Miranda from Brazil, uh, Lee Gasner from Australia, and Lerato Mpofu from the Southern African office. And um, how we're going to do it is ask them to give us an overview of the project. And I'll kick us off with the first question, which they'll all answer, which will hopefully give all of our um, participants uh, a bit of context to ask questions into. And um, we're not necessarily going to prioritize one project. We're going to try and draw some universal learnings across the various experiences, because there are many. Um, and, and, and particularly, you know, not necessarily in, in Rios' uh, methodology, not rush to trying to find the answers of how to do this, but what might be, um, what, what might, might we be learning about things that we um, coming up against? So what are some of the obstacles or real challenges that uh, maybe together we might be able to shed some light on? So um, let me uh, hand over now to the panelists and um, I'd like to invite the panelists to speak in this order, uh, Lee, Lerato and Mariana. And I'm asking each of them to speak for two minutes, just to give um, a, a bit of an introduction to themselves and their role in the particular project they'll speak to or projects and a, and a, and a high level overview of those projects. And just so you know, we can share information and more detail about the projects with you um, if you're interested, um, but you know, we don't want to trade off like a whole lot of download on the projects for, uh, instead of really learning together. So um, I'd like to, sorry, there's one more announcement that I just wanted to make. It is in the, the protocols, but just so you know that this call is being recorded. So whether you want to share it or, you know, if you want to be careful <laughs> about what is shared, uh, know that it will be recorded. So. Over to you, Lee. Welcome. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Colleen. And uh, it's probably best if I um, contextualise myself of nearly 13 years of working in this space, particularly at the systems level. And uh, from being in government and trying to work with uh, government and non-government agencies to actually address violence against women, and, um, sexual assault and family violence, and more recently, or over the last couple of years, having worked with the Commonwealth Government in Australia, 
in regard to uh, a national consultation on improving perpetrator intervention, understanding what are the desired outcomes for perpetrator intervention. And also just uh, recently working with the Victoria Police here and the Aboriginal community in improving responses uh, for police in working with uh, Indigenous communities. So the, probably the largest one we've had is uh, over the last couple of years is the national consultation where we actually touched base with over 700 stakeholders across Australia to actually understand um, what would be good outcome standards in relation to addressing perpetrator intervention. So that's, um, and that has been uh, a quite a large piece of work, which has also continued on to try and look at performance measures. Uh, having also worked in places of um, actually leading in Victoria, in Australia, the integration of family res um, response to family violence, which was able to bring up a social policy document that is, uh, still exists and has only just now been reviewed with the recent Royal Commission here in Australia around family violence. So in briefly, that's, uh, that's the context I've been working in for now, as I said, 13 years. And having also worked um, similarly with you uh, over there, Colleen, and also having had experience in China working with the Supreme People's Court on response to family violence. Uh, enormous amount of differences, but on the other hand, underlying and fundamental similarities, no matter what jurisdiction I work in. Thank you, Lee. I'm uh, keeping track on my little timer here and you made it in two minutes. <laughs> Um, right, so uh, thank you for that overview. Let's move over to Lerato from the Rio Southern African office. Hi, I'm Lerato and just by way of introduction, I'm with the Rio South African office and I'm a junior consultant. Within the project, I've been holding the role of learning histories and support documentation, um, enrollment calls and keeping in touch with people and just getting an overview of everything that's happening in the project. So I can quickly move into that. So our social lab is on violence against women, and it's been convened by Seoul City Justice, Social Justice Institute, which is an NGO that works with young women and girls and has convened this lab to look at violence against women in South Africa as it does persist despite all the efforts made to address it and to curb it as an issue in this country. Um, the project started early 2016, around April, that's when it was convened. And from then up to now, we've gone through some different stages. So synthesis, trying to deepen our understanding of the issue of violence in South Africa, looking at the history, and we've gone through various stages of looking at innovations and prototypes of what we can do to um, curb the problem in South Africa. So the project is funded by USAID and that's the main funder and it's about looking at transformative um, solutions to approaching the violence against women problem in South Africa. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Lerato. Because you've got uh, sort of a little bit more time left, do you want to just share a little bit of the kinds of organisations and people involved um, in the project and the number of people that we're dealing with? Sure. So we have about 45 participants that are from across the sector in violence against women. We work with civil societies, we work with government organisations, we work with private sector, so we're looking at different um, civil societies that work in the area of violence against women. And we have some activists as well in the space, so university activists who are trying to enact change in their areas of influence as well. Yeah. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Mariana from the Rios Brazil office. 
Thanks, Colleen. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all. My name is Mariana. I'm Brazilian. Uh, I am a sociologist and I've been working with women for more than 10 years. So I worked in prisons in Brazil and also in Africa, in some parts of Africa, mainly Malawi and Mozambique, where when I met Rios and started work with this issue. In Brazil, we are, start we are starting our lab we are in the beginning of the process and different from Australia and South Africa, the convener in Brazil is a private foundation, the private institute. And our main objective is to build a systemic understanding of the issue in Brazil, of this problem, and also build a strategic, a strategic plan whereby we can um, have multi-sector actions where we can add all the perspectives and act on the problem and that's me colin great thank you mariana so as mariana indicated um we're all at very different phases of um using a relatively similar approach um so lee's been working for a number of years at convening labs which are about bringing uh, the whole system um, that is affected and influences the reality of violence against women um, into a process to try to more like Mariana uh, suggested to to try to understand more systemically um, the issues of of what creates this high level of violence and uh, why it is, um, despite many, many efforts, stuck in some cases. Um, and so the lab tries to uncover what, where are the opportunities to innovate? And that takes a while and it's not a linear process. Um, and so um, with Lee on the one end and the Southern African office now, um, just over a year in on quite an intensive social lab and the Brazilian office at the beginning, um, each of these offices will um, have a different uh, perspective on what they're running up against because it's different phases in the project. Um, and so I, I thought as, as, as an introduction to the questions, a good start would be to ask each of the, the RIOS teams, what has been really hard? What's been a real obstacle or challenge that surprised you and has come up um, as you've um, moved into setting up a social lab. And if you can do it by way of, you know, storytelling so that uh, you can give some examples, um, obviously, you know, protecting some people's confidentiality. Um, and, um, and then we'll try and see what are we noticing across some of these like, small, deeper challenges that get in the way um, and open it up to, to broader questions. So um, I'm going to do it the other way around. So Mariana, if you don't mind, if we start with you, um, just, you know, like in this really early stages of setting things up, what are you noticing as your, so your major ch challenges in, in, in getting going? Thanks, Carl. As we are just starting the project and we are starting to talk with uh, the, some actors, it has been a challenge to get the government involved so how can we bring the government together? We are crossing a sort of political crisis in Brazil. Uh, I'm not going deeper into this issue, but it's also something that we have to, uh, to, take, to have in mind. So to involve the government, it has been a challenge. And it's, uh, it is, it, it's also important to, to plan or to, to know better how to involve the society. How can we inform? How can we give? How can we put things on the media that society can be more involved in the issue? So those are the two big challenges that we are facing up to now. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm hearing, um, you know, something that's, I think, probably a challenge in many different contexts, depending on who convenes, <clears throat> um, but involving government who are so crucial 
to addressing this issue and also like a broader in engagement. How does this project really capture the imagination of society out there and, and hear their voice? Thank you. Okay, Lerato. Okay, so in South Africa, we have a different set of challenges and these link mostly to the history of the country and how violence was normalized during apartheid times and we still have delicate race dynamics within the country. So this was very surprising to some extent, but not entirely new to have um, the intersectionality of all the issues that happen in this country, so poverty, race dynamics, intersect within violence against women. And that has um, revealed itself as quite challenging because it's not outside the space only, it's within the sector, access to funding, relationships between particular organizations and how we interact in the room as well and who participates and who has say and how violence in the country is viewed as a whole. So that's been our biggest stumbling block just to maintain conversation without falling apart and, you know, falling into the racial dynamics and those deep cracks that exist in this country. So that's what I can say has been a big challenge in the problem, of course, with other things like relationships between civil sector and um, government and funders and all of that. But the biggest bedrock that's a challenge right now is the racial dynamics because of the history of the country. Thank you, Lerato. So um, again, if I can just sort of try and uh, summarize a bit. Um, the, the thing, the running theme through this lab that has come up as a major challenge and has shown up actually um, in many examples within the lab, not just talking about the issues out there, is um, the uh, issues of race and power inequality um, and, um, and how those have really been amplified in the relationships between people in the lab. Um, and, uh, you know, we can speak about that a little bit later, but um, that's kind of the essence of the key, you know, the, the, the key issue to work with, even with the issues of substance, um, uh, programmatic substance, for example, um, that, that uh, this lab is addressing. Thank you, Lerato. Um, and finally, Lee. Um, thanks, Colleen. Look, uh, firstly, absolutely, um, supporting what uh, both Mariana and Murata have said about relationships and getting government involved. But uh, in the time I've worked in this space, um, the issue about the assumptions people bring in into the process is, is quite enormous. And the story I have around that is when I was chairing a statewide steering committee of government and non-government, it became obvious that not everyone actually understood what police or the courts could or couldn't do. And we spent some time, and being very quick on this story, we spent some time with a police prosecutor and a magistrate and just said, not about how good is your service, just what can you do and can't you do. And after about two hours into this work, some people became quite emotional around the table and actually, and in stopping the meeting and asking what was happening, they said, I've just realised I have been advising victims of family violence wrongly for the last 15 years. I thought police could do something. I thought courts could do something. And everyone sort of then sat back in their chairs and realised that they made assumptions about each other and what they could do and what they couldn't do, which, which ultimately could turn into friction. And so the ability to just stop and listen to what the system actually how the X system actually works became a major thing. I suppose the other key challenge I've seen um, is when you're actually starting to approach to work in this space is how do you actually frame it? Um, you know, do you start at primary prevention? Do you start at secondary response or tertiary response? This is a massive issue. And who can you get engaged? And sometimes to try and embrace all of it can be too much for the lab. 
So the steps taken to actually frame where are you going to put your attention can take a bit of time and is time um, worth being spent um, because there will be again friction there. So um, there, there's, there's some of the, there, there's other challenges, but they're two of the biggest challenges I've seen and I continue to see when trying to work in um, working violence against women. Uh, the work we did in Australia, particularly around perpetrator intervention, even though that was focused, still embraced sexual assault and family violence. And they can be two quite different sectors in how they respond. I might leave it there, Colleen. Great, thank you to the three of you. And um, to, so, so now we've set up some three challenges. So um, just to sort of um, go backwards on it, the two challenges Lee brought up were the issues of assumptions that these various sectors uh, hold about each other, what they can and can't do. Um, and then that profoundly informs what their programs and approaches are about on these assumptions. And also the extent of the issue of violence against women. So how do you frame it? Where do you start? Um, and then Lerato speaking about um, how do you work with um, real issues of power dynamics and race and um, a lot of anger and pain uh, that, that comes with that as people are trying to work together. Um, and Mariana's uh, uh, initial sort of provocation is just how do you involve government? Because government, as we all know, isn't one thing. Um, and so who, who's responsible? Uh, how do we get a, a layer of government that has influence uh, involved? So, so three great, uh, in a way, let's call them provocations. And before we hand it over to, um, to general questions about these processes, I'm going to ask the panelists just for a final round of any observations they've, um, they have uh, since they're hearing their fellow panelists speak. So anything else that's sort of come up as an interesting sort of uh, cross-learning or question um, that's, uh, that has come up for you. And um, if, if it's helpful, but this is a difficult ask to the panelists, um, if, if you think it's helpful to start touching on how you address these challenges without trying to go too deeply into answer mode, um, Lee started doing that by saying, uh, you know, talking about how uh, th they've chosen to frame things. Um, but, but just give us a little bit of an indication of your approach of where you've started to work with some of these challenges. And, um, and then we can open it up. So general observations or anything you want to share about how it's been useful to deal with these challenges. So Lorata, I'm going to pick on you first. Ooh, okay, some big questions there. Um, I'll start with the learnings that we can draw from each other because as I was listening to both Lee and Mariana speak, um, there seem to be similarities essentially from how it's so easy for us to misunderstand each other even in the process of wanting to work together. And this comes from coming in with assumptions, these comes from expectations that you have of what someone else should be doing. And that translates to work in um, the Southern African office as well with, uh, with relationship to the war project, that um, there were a lot of assumptions that came into the room that were based on race, based on power dynamics, based on class based on wealth and all of these assumptions that people come in to the space with and that can actually hinder the process. And I've found that we've been going through a process of relearning, unlearning, opening up, having conversations, talking and talking and digging deeper. So just unpacking more, trying to understand what this means within our context. And I found that in that process of talking and learning from each other and really listening deeply, we've been 
getting to a point where we're making small shifts, small shifts in our own perspectives that actually can lead to systemic change within the system once we have a better understanding of each other and of the space that we occupy in this country, in the social lab, and in this problem. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thanks, Lerato. I'm going to just try and capture some of this learning so that they're good questions to, to they, they, they're, good, they're a good place from which quest, further questions can come. So you're really saying, you know, um, a lot of it has been like staying in conversations about uncovering these, these assumptions. Um, and, uh, and so by implication, you know, the labs actually spent a, a disproportionate amount of time um, in, in the difficult conversations around these issues in order to create the sort of necessary working relationships to work on, um, on specific in innovation ideas that, that have already come up quite early in the lab. <clears throat> so um, thank you, Lerato. And um, with that, I'm going to sort of shift back to Mariana uh, to speak a little bit about your observations, Mariana, but also just how you're addressing, you know, how to involve government or society or some of the other things that you've heard uh, the other two panelists share. Mm -hmm. We are quite in the beginning, Colleen, of our project. So I can grab some, some things here, but I will carefully talk about things that I think it will help with our call. Um, as I'm leading the project, we come across um, a very difficult situation where we can see the fragment, frag it's just like the sector is fragmented. They're not working together. And because there are so much assumptions, it's quite difficult to move forward and to put those actors, actors to talk and to relearn and to build a new understanding of the issue. So um, it hit me home when Lee brings this, um, the, assumptions, the assumptions that people are working with. Uh, uh, it's, it's also very, very meaningful uh, to us when, when Lerato says about the race dynamics, because in Brazil, uh, we also have the race dynamics and a little bit of complexity there because and then we have the whole Europeans and the black people coming from Africa and also the Indians. So we have these layers of complexity of leading in leading with the issue in Brazil and in the government because they don't have, they don't know how to address the, this complexity. It's uh, another layer to include in our lab when the, when the lab will run the next semester. So I think we can learn from those speeches. Mm, thank you, Mariana. Um, you've introduced this, um, you know, it's not just a, it's not just a, a, a binary thing of like black and white. Uh, there's all sorts of layers of complexity that come into these assumptions or government and civil society. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's the word that Lerati used, the intersectionality um, of all of this coming together and um, and what ultimately happens is uh, the most vulnerable, um, mostly women, um, and vulnerable women are the ones who bear the brunt of the inefficiencies of these different actors to find each other. So, um, yeah, I think we've, <laughs> we've got a big elephant in the room. Thank you. So over to you, Lee. Um, yeah, Colin, you, 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 um, firstly, again, We've experienced the same thing around race, and, and having worked with you in South Africa, and Lorato brought up with our with our indigenous population the complexity of things such as colonialism and other issues that become an overlay on this. That means you address you have to address this differently with different um, parts of society. Um, I often think that I see that the amount of um, commitment by a government is sometimes commensurate with the amount of commitment by a community and society itself as to recognising this as a problem. And, uh, and often if community uh, 
see it as an issue, then government will start to see it an issue. Um, and that's what I mean generally, not just parts of community. Um, I think some of the greatest learning is to take the time to work through the assumptions, to actually understand the system and why do people hold, their, hold those views. They, they may not be assisting, but they, in their eyes, are legitimate views and, and as to why they're held. Uh, so the other thing around this, which comes a little bit back to the framing bit, is that we are just talking about violence against women, but it's also, <clears throat> this is about protecting children. Um, homelessness is, is, um, is driven by violence against women, drug and alcohol dependence mental health, um, just to make the complexity even even more so. Uh, and the intersectionality of those can be, can be uh, enormous. Um, so this is why working in this space is really a systems issue and it can't be anything other than a systems issue. And, um, and, and so, it, to start in a to start working here, you do have to try and focus as to where's the place we need to start that's going to have the greatest return on our efforts to then build on that. Uh, so I think again, I just see across the three examples we've been talking about, the three countries, there are some different makeups, but there's some fundamental um, similarities that are in operation. And just one last thing is that to remember that it's so much of this is a hidden crime, is a hidden issue. Family violence is 80%, 70 to 80% underreported. Thank you, Lee. So um, where we've got to is just uh, uh, the layers of issues and I guess the uh, tentacles that inform the reality of violence against women is really hard to get your arms around in understanding, never mind getting those people into a room together, who are the right people um, and where can we really make a difference? So where do we start? Like where we've got a chance of some kind of entry point and there might be multiple entry points to address something more systemically. So um, I hope that's given uh, those of you that are participants um, a good enough context to ask questions into. So I'm going to um, just hand over to all of you uh, who I only know through the chat box to um, start to populate it with any questions or observations you might have. I see one has already um, come up. So feel free to everyone else. To, to type in, you don't have to wait for a break. We'll come back to the questions. And uh, James McDougall has um, mentioned, Lee mentioned children. Do any of the panelists have any insights as to the visibility or otherwise of children and young people in their conversations? Do you want me to talk to that? You're on mute, Colleen. <laughs> Sorry, um, I was on mute. Uh, Lee, please speak to the children's question. Go ahead. Um, James, it's, it's, you bring up a really good point because um, the, the focus of children is, has, has not been there in many instances from in my experience and is now being understood more and more. Um, for example, it was only recently, relatively recently, that um, police were instructed to actually start to ask the welfare of the children at a domestic violence incident and to talk to the children and to actually understand what are they seeing. Um, the reason that it's, it's so important is the fact of perpetuating the cycles of violence of what children see. And uh, it is well known that children who are subjected to such violence, such things as educational 
uh, opportunities uh, restricted and so many other things and that they may be going to repeat violence. But generally speaking is that um, the issue of children hasn't been as visible as it should be and quite often most jurisdictions probably have child protection and family violence responses in different silos and so they need to talk together. Thank you, Lee. Um, so there are two more questions that have come through. And um, I just want to, um, be, as people are starting to type, just to pay attention to who uh, you're typing the question to. So you'll see there's a two section. You can type to everyone or to the panelists. Um, we'd prefer you to type to everyone so that the questions are visible, but I can see the questions to the panelists. So. I will um, read out the questions even as they are to the panelists and to everyone. Um, two questions came through specifically uh, related to the sort of methodology. So how do you assess what is the best entry point when we start? So for, for I think this is probably for Lee and Lerato, you know, how did we get to identifying um, the, the places where people felt there could be a shift? Um, and uh, the second question about methodology is how do you begin to make assumptions explicit? Um, particularly as you're starting to enroll people, what are some of the ways in which to do that? So let's start with the methodology and then we'll move to the next uh, question about uh, religious communities expectations on safety around domestic violence especially in a Muslim context. So I will ask that question afterwards, but let's start with the methodology. Uh, Lerato, do you want to kick us off and then we'll move to Lee? Sure, um, I'm going to take the one where we can best assess which one is the best entry point. And um, I think I'll go through that with the process of the dialogue interviews and actually having a synthesis. So for us, our entry point into the social lab in terms of people deciding how they wanted to frame it and how we would move forward through the progression of the social lab was actually to just have deep conversations about our different perspectives and understandings of the issue of violence against women. So just conversationally ask people's where, where do they see the problem to be the biggest challenge? What's their understanding of violence against women? And from then on, you can start sort of coming up with themes that emerge where people have similar views or people have highly divergent views. And from then on, that can be used as a process of understanding where there's similarities and differences and then sort of framing how you can move forward with questions that address both the similarities and the differences. And over the progress of the social lab, some areas will become more important for that particular phase, but it's just to go through the process, unpack, repeat, unpack. And yeah, that's, that's how I can say that we've looked at the entry point is just speaking to everyone and trying to meet people where they are and having a good understanding collectively of what we know and what we don't know and what we assume and what you know yeah the different perspectives and perceptions great thank you Lorato. and um lee before I, I hand over to you i just want to read something out that's come through so just to remind you, some questions are coming only to panelists and some are coming to everyone. And I will talk to the questions that are coming to panelists, but I won't reveal who it's coming from because I imagine that you probably have some sensitivity there. So um, there's a, an observation that builds on what you've just said, Lerato, from a message to the panelists that I would like to share. And it says, Gandhi's advice about choosing an entry point into complex oppressive systems is to go ahead with whatever point is most accessible to the most of the people who are ready to start. The key is to monitor effects of any of your actions on the different aspects of the problem, since the other aspects of the complex system are interconnected. So there's quite a lot in there. 
Um, but I mean, essentially what I'm reading into this is start with is real energy from the most amount of people and be mindful of the knock on effects and of the impact of these actions because the inter they're, they're interconnected. So thank you for that contribution. Um, it's not a question there, but it's a, it's a great addition to where we start. So um, Lee, over to you. And just to let you know, the questions are running in um, that might not be visible to all of you as panelists. So if you can try and be as succinct as possible in your answers, because we've only got 15 minutes left together. Um, I'm looking at the one around the methodological point of view in regard to the assumptions, making assumptions explicit. Um, and, and I think uh, one of the biggest learnings I had in doing this was we didn't do it at the time, but I realised assumptions could have become much more explicit through learning journeys, through the actual experience and visceral experience of walking into parts of the system you don't normally a person doesn't normally work with or work in. And uh, so that that's probably very much in the sensing phase, right? uh, phase rather than enrolment phase, but it might mean that in seeing that you then have to revisit the enrolment phase. Um, but it's um, the way to make assumptions explicit is the, the other way is as much as possible so people just for the time being, not to defend their positions. So they can actually listen to what the assumptions are that are alive in the room. Great, thank you, Lee. And um, do you mind for those people that aren't familiar with the methodology terms to explain what a learning journey is? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it, it is a it is a, an experience, probably a sort of visceral and personal experience of actually walking into, for example, um, a refuge or a counselling service or somewhere else or a police station where they're dealing with this so they can or sit in a court so they can actually see parts of the system operating as they are to give them an idea as to what they, to, for them to start to inform themselves of probably what they didn't know. Most people come to this with extraordinary experience just around their part of the system. Okay, great. Thank you, um, Lee. Um, I'm going to ask you all, uh, if, you, if you want to answer a question, um, if you think it's relevant, um, about the role of men. Um, so a question here has been asked, um, and I'll just read it out. Having worked in this field several years ago, I'm curious to know whether you're detecting a trend of men in your different contexts, taking increasing responsibility for working preventatively with other men on issues of violence against women. And um, Mariana, please feel free to chime in with your experience as well in working with, in prisons. Um, so it's not just related to the lab. So maybe Mariana, let's start with you. Colleen, I would have to listen first instead okay. of speaking yeah, out loud. No. Okay. So um, let's uh, let's just open it up. Okay, Lee, I see you've come off mute. So why don't we start with you? Uh, there has, I mean, the work that we did was around perpetrator intervention. Uh, what I've seen over the last number of years is a great willingness to work with men, to work with those who actually perpetrate the violence, um, not with those who, not just merely with those who are the victims of the violence. Uh, and I'm probably talking more from an Australian perspective here, is that there's a lot of work now being done about working with men. One of the is biggest issues in regard to working with men is that uh, the evidence as to what works and what doesn't work uh, is, is not great. It's, it's building, there's certainly it's building. And again, sort of coming back to this issue of different parts of community, how, if, how you work with men in an Aboriginal context in Australia will be quite different than how you want to work with men in a Western context. So 
again, it's it's a complexity, but there is a there is a great I've seen a greater emphasis to trying to actually work with men. When we started this journey years ago, the two areas would not talk to each other. Um, my experience in Australia is that is uh, men's services and women's services. My experience now in Australia is that they are very much working together and seeing that they both need to work together in proper, um, uh, in, in what we call here, which is an unfortunate term, intervention perpetrators. Thank you, Lee. Lerato, anything to add from your side? And if I may um, ask you to share a bit of how we've been reframing working with men um just to try and like what lee brought up there how difficult it is to bring men and women together working on violence against women organizations and so we've uh Lerato in particular has been working on the reframing to yeah to address it from a, a slightly different place okay um well so in the social lab we have explored working with men and working with perpetrators but however just to bring in an intersectional approach and to bring some feminism into the mix is how can we use feminist approaches to working with men that are inclusive as in bringing them along into the process this is because um when you look at the context in South Africa, working with men is a contentious issue. There's people for it and there's people against it. But when you look at the root of feminism, it's actually very inclusive as opposed to divisive. So there's an exploration of how can we work with men in a pro-feminist way. So in that way, also tackle patriarchy and other um, oppressive systems whilst you work with um, men. So yeah, that's the long and short I can give of it now, Paul, unless if you have any pointed questions. No, that's great, Lerato. Um, maybe just to add um, that uh, in this particular social lab, the Southern African Social Lab, there are men involved. Um, and maybe Lerato, you can speak a bit to, um, you know, the proportion of men and maybe some of their challenges and, or actually the lab's challenges, if any, with the men in the room. Um, and, um, yeah, any observation you have, and maybe even where they come from, the kinds of organisations. Mm. Okay, so um, in the social lab, we do have a few males in the room. We have um, some from the civil sector, from Sonke Gender Justice, which is actually a great organization that does work with men. And we've had some provocateurs come in from Ebukosi New Solutions. We have a program that they run that also works with men and empowering men, but also getting men to explore their femininity and to explore their multiple identities. So we have very I want to call them progressive organizations in terms of how they approach working with men and their approach to violence against women. However, in the social lab, they've been feeling very silenced. And this is because it's a very strong feminist space where you have um, a lot of female organizations and there's still those complexities of how do we work with men without labeling all men or men who want to work with women to solve this problem in the same, paint them in the same brush that we paint perpetrators. So how do we open those lines of communication so that the men who do want to participate can also feel heard without leaning or skewing the balance towards a patriarchal um, dynamic where all the men take up the airspace. So it's been a very complex, delicate situation, but we do have um, men involved who are involved and engaged and really do want to make a positive contribution. Great. Thank you, Lerato. 
Okay, so um, there was a question. Sorry, Mariana, you've just taken yourself off mute. Great, have you got I something to add? to add? I just would like yeah. to add something. Uh, it was a great question. And in Brazil, we've decided to actually include the man is, is at the center of the process. And uh, we are also um, planning to address what is violence. Because this is also an issue that needs to be addressed within the lab and with men participation. So it's also a cultural barrier whereby we need to address what is violence. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mariana. Um, so some, uh, in answer to that question, not necessarily in answer to what's changed over the period of time, but really a sort of reframing, rethinking of how to involve men um, and in these kinds of processes and how they're showing up. Um, obviously not all men are the same, but um, the, the, the role of men and how that's showing up. So um, I think we've got time for the final question, which um, I mentioned a bit earlier that I'd like to come back to. And um, the question to the panelists is the following. Thanks for the informal, informing insights. Any panelist has experience with the religious community's expectations of safety around domestic violence, especially in a Muslim context. I'm gonna open it up and feel free to to chime in and I also just want to invite panelists to to draw from their broader experience it doesn't just have to be in the project that you're speaking of because you all three of you have vast experience with this kind of work um that's a really good question uh because our, our experience, my experience, is that sometimes religion can be used in, as an excuse for um, whether it's uh, emotional violence or physical violence or financial violence, um, which can quite often be um, within that religion, there can be a tension uh, that religion can't be used, it can't be used as any sort of an excuse. Uh, often, sometimes elders in particular religions do, will sort of use it as a power, as a power, a tool of power. Uh, but uh, I suppose from our experience here is that it doesn't matter what religion, violence against women is not tolerated and is not an excuse. Um, and, I say that knowing that uh, this is a, a really big discussion across um, across religions, uh, without being too, without being specific about any particular religion. But it's um, it, it it has been used as an excuse, um, but it's also been regarded as there is no excuse, and religion is no excuse for violence against women. Thank you, Lee. Um, Mariana Lerato, anything to add from your side? Um, and you know, maybe feel free to build on or give a slightly alternative view to what Lee's um, proposed here. Um, Lerato. Um, it's a big question, and I want to speak more of the more from the South African perspective and Christianity, because we've touched on those um, topics within the social lab. And I don't want to answer on things that I'm not yeah, it, familiar with, like intimately lest I offend or give a problematic view. So I'll go with what I know and hopefully that can be extended if possible to other religious contexts. So I'm um, looking at Christianity and specifically with our approach in the social lab, there's um, an understanding that religion sort of reinforces patriarchy, which then reinforces violence against women. But what we've also been trying to look at from a different angle is um, approaching religious leaders and Christian, um, Christian groups 
in a way that doesn't um, isolate members you've subscribed to that religion. So how do you bring conversations of patriarchy and power imbalances into the religious community, making sure that women who do, um, who are victims of violence can seek those channels whilst, with it, while staying within their religious system and not feeling like they're going against their religion. So that's the kind of um, alternative approach we've been looking at to see how can we broaden the conversation past um, reinforcing and using religion as a tool that could actually be used to fight against violence against women. Yeah. Thank you, Lerato. So, um, Mariana, you have the last panel comment before we move us to a close. Okay, I feel fully represented from what Lee and Lerato said. Uh, from my experience in prisons and in Africa and Malawi, um, when we are in this environment, there are two religions. Uh, I used to broadcast or I used to bring awareness of the cost of the violence. You know, try to try to make it bigger. You know, the cost of the violence can also affect your way of being or, and, or way of acting. So you move a little bit the issue, you move the point so we can bring awareness of the issue from, from, the, from that point. Good, thank you, Mariana. Um, and that um, hopefully it isn't necessarily answering the question about particularly in, Muslim, in a Muslim context. And I, I wonder about putting that question out um, beyond this call, because I think um, I think this issue does play out subtly differently in faith based communities. And there are some there are some obviously some universal similarities about the, the challenges of working uh, in a both and environment. Um, there was an extra observation to everyone. I guess the question is to what extent faith based organizations participate in labs <clears throat> from Kirsten and um, you know, certainly in the, the Southern African lab, and, and I'm, I'm sure that Mariana and Lee can attest, faith-based organizations are very active in this issue. Um, and so um, I think it's a really, like Lee said, it's a great question um, and a very important one uh, because faith-based organizations are such agents for change in society. Um, so this is a, a real opportunity. So, um, I'm going to have to draw us to a close, unfortunately. There's a few questions that haven't been answered. Um, and what I want to suggest is we will send a follow-up email to all of you because you've all registered with, um, uh, with the possibility of adding the questions that haven't been um, answered. And we will uh, try and address those questions. And if we need to create an ongoing learning group, we will. Um, so this was the beginning um, of, of hopefully a much more accessible way that we can learn out loud together. And um, I just want to thank all of you for participating in the experiment and um, particularly for our panelists for sharing um, so honestly and generously about um, some of the challenges they're facing. And um, to all of you, I hope it's been helpful. And um, I just want to do a last, just give it a half a second to check if there's anything I'm missing in announcing from either the panelists or the, 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 the very helpful administrators behind the scenes, Che and L. Nope. Okay. We're all set. So um, thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll be in touch.